Read them. And <clears throat> maybe make a couple of opening remarks. And shall we have the attendees just come up as soon as, okay. So the first question is, what does it mean to you to be centrist? Is that a term that we should be proud of? The second is, what is the relationship between rabbinic authority and our ability to think and practice as we see fit as individuals? And the third is, we often focus on the problems we face and the difficulties of Jewish life. What are the things of which our generation should be the most proud of? What are our greatest successes and how can we build on them? So before we actually get in, since I was asked to make a, an opening remark, <clears throat> I just want to sort of throw out a bomb, if you'd like, and to say that maybe the word preserving is not the right word. Uh, in fact, I was reading on the cover of uh, the Orthodox Union magazine, Preser Preserving Our Tradition, and even the title of this whole convention is Preserving Our Values. So in, in the whole spirit of, you know, accepting uh, intellectual challenges, I think the, the mindset behind the word preserving is, is, is not, it's a missed opportunity. Um, I think we, we can do better than that. <clears throat> when, when you think of preserving, you think of keeping something and almost filing it away, and it's safe, and I can control it. <clears throat> but from what I saw the other night at the opening convention, when I saw the, what we call the kids who have left the derech, who've, uh, who've abandoned the Judaism, I saw that they needed more than the idea of preserving. And I think a, a stronger idea that we're more capable of as a community is the idea of enhancing rather than preserving. And the minute you say the word enhancing, then it brings out the best in us. Then instead of assuming that we should follow the rules because God said so, then we try to reach higher and ask the question that I think we rarely, rarely ask, which is why. Uh, it turns out that for many of us, we don't really need an answer. Growing up in the ghettos of Morocco, I can guarantee you I needed no answer for why I should stay Jewish and why I should do the mitzvahs and why I should go to shul. It's just the way things were. But we live in a completely different world now where many, many Jews need to know why. Why they should put on tefillin, why they should kiss the mezuzah, why they should go to shul, and so forth. And some of the answers we've had are powerful but they're not as powerful as they can be. So with that set up, with that set up, I would like to invite our panelists to see if together this morning we can rise up to the challenge and see, looking towards the future, how we can, uh, how we can enhance the great tradition that, that we have. So I will start with my friend, Julie Fax, with the first question, what does it mean to you to be centrist, and is that a term that we should be proud of? I don't think I should stand behind this thing, huh? Can you see my face? Am I better, up, better off over here? Is that, that's, I think that's better. This FEMA wasn't made for five foot tall women, I guess. Yeah, I'm not going to stand on Bar Mitzvah Boy steps. So <laughs> thought about it, but I'm not going to. Um, so, centrist orthodox. I, you know, I, does anybody use the term centrist? I don't know. I've no, I don't use it much. At the Jewish Journal, you know, I, I write for the Jewish Journal, and we're always playing with these terms. So there's, you know, the ultra-Orthodox don't like ultra anymore because ultra seems like it's too orthodox. So they want us to call them fervently orthodox. But if they're fervently orthodox, does that make me unfervently orthodox? So you, you can play with these terms a lot. We call ourselves modern orthodox, centrist orthodox, or open orthodox. I'm not sure what it means. Centrist orthodox is a little problematic for me because it, I'm center compared to who? So it means that I'm defining myself compared to someone else, which I don't necessarily like to do. So I can just ask the question of what defines my orthodoxy and what makes it specifically my own. And the personal orthodoxy that I pursue is one that um, embraces Western values, uh, not in a default position and not because I have to, because this is where I live, but because I think that the values are worthwhile. Um, they make me a better person. They make me a better Jew. And I think that the values that we absorb from the culture around us when we engage the culture around us in a proactive, positive way makes our community a stronger community. I'm going to give you a few examples to tell you um, what I mean. If you look at the way Halakha deals with people with mental and physical disabilities and the way that that's developed over the years, and I don't know if I perhaps missed something in the session that I didn't go to this morning on um, families with special needs. If you look at the way it's developed over the years, you can see that the, that the Western ethic of um, accepting people with mental and physical disabilities
qualities as full people is something that's not necessarily inherent in the halacha, which kind of put, puts them aside in a different category. Yet, I don't think any of us would say that we want our community to be there. And I think that our community has been enriched by bringing them into our community as full-fledged people as they are and as they should be considered. And I think that that's something that we absorb from Western culture. Um, a few other examples, um, things like democracy, things like civil rights and understanding that people are created equal, not necessarily a Jewish value that people are created equal. And yet I think it's something that I would not want to dismiss from my life. Um, culture, the art, literature. I don't want to push literature away from my life. I think that Western literature is something that I want to embrace. And without embracing um, Western music, Jewish music, wouldn't be where it is today. And then we wouldn't have had the Maccabees go viral with their Hanukkah song on YouTube, <laughs> which is how many, you know, millions and millions of people. Um, and even if you look at how we treat women, that is something that's been deeply influenced by our Western culture and because we engage Western culture. Um, and if you think that that's a, that, I don't even think it's particular to modern orthodoxy, although you might want to say that it is, but when I look at um, my family, my nieces, at no space Yaakov, and they are celebrating their bat mitzvahs. They're not in shul celebrating their bat mitzvahs. They're doing it at home. They're giving Gibri Torah to their class, to girls who are in their class. But they are marking that they're having a bar mitzvah, a bat mitzvah and it's a communal celebration. That's not something that grew up within Judaism itself. That's something that came in when we allowed feminism to influence Judaism. And it's something that people want to say, we don't do that. We don't allow these influences in, but we do allow these influences in. That's a positive thing. That's a good thing. And I think that by engaging our culture, we become more relevant to our culture. Our culture becomes more relevant to us, and then we can really um, impact the world. And we can bring our Jewish values out to, who, to the people that are listening to us. If we keep ourselves in a bubble and don't engage with our own culture, then we are, uh, we're not impacting anybody else who's around us. We're just staying within our own bubble, and that bubble is a very fragile bubble when it's something that is so, so isolated.
which denomination? She says, oh my gosh, has it come to this? Okay, I'll have 22 Orthodox, 15 conservative, and 17 reform. And we have all these different expressions, right? FFB is from, from birth, and BT is Balchuva. My sister made up one that's FBC, from but cool. <laughs> and that's why when we had our baby a year ago, I announced from the pulpit that I'm proud to say that this is our first LFFB, Laker fan from birth. <laughs> But so if the Rambam says that it's important to be a centrist, and this is a way of emulating the ways of God, but the question is, what does it mean to be a centrist? So, and I think, but let, let me tell you what I think it means, and I think it is a term that we can be and we should be proud of. Yaakov, Jacob has a dream of a ladder. And it says, Varosha Megea that the head of the ladder was in heaven, but but the foot of the ladder was here on the ground. And there were angels ascending and descending on that ladder. And perhaps the message, or one of the messages of that dream that Yaakov had, that Jacob had, many, many years ago, is a message relevant for us. And that is that on the one hand, we reject Greek culture, which has an emphasis on the needs and pleasures of the body. The Greeks thought that the highest level of holiness that a person can reach in this world is the more you emphasize the bodily pleasures as a way we fulfill holiness in this world. But at the same time, we also reject Christianity, or, or the view that the highest way of holiness in this world is to totally reject the body and the physical world. Right? And that, that the highest way of holiness is asceticism and abstinence and totally disregarding the pleasures that we have here in our lives. And what, what we believe, or what uh, you might say, centrist Orthodox Jew believes, or you might say, you know, that certainly my view, the way I was, the way I was raised, is that we don't reject, um, you know, or we, or we don't only accept one of these values. And we don't say that one has to reject the other, but we try to merge and synthesize both the spiritual world together with the physical world. We try, on the one hand, uh, we're committed in the highest and most maximalist way to the world of Torah and to the traditions of Torah mitzvot. But at the same time, we live in the real world. We're sula mitzvot art, so we're here living on the real world, in the, in the real world. So what does it mean to live in the real world? And that's really what it means to be modern Orthodox, right? It's the courage to be both committed to the traditions and the laws of the mitzvot as they were passed on over the course of the generations. But it also means that we're modern in the sense that we live in the real world and we're sensitive to the, to the world around us. So, on one level, this means that being an observant Jew in this world doesn't mean that we have to escape from the world around us, but rather it means that we can apply the laws of the Torah and the highest level of observance of the Torah is when applied to the world around us. Um, the the arts and the sciences and the general culture is not something that is a contradiction to the ways of the Torah, right? But they can actually help us understand the ways of the Torah and the ways of God. And this needs to be our heads in heaven, right? But also, Sula Musavarta, we're here on this, on this world, means that we're engaged in Torah. We value and we view this extremely important Torah, Sila, traditional mitzvot. But yet, also at the same time, as we're celebrating the life of God, we were raised in the values that it's important. And it's a total value to contribute to general society as well. There are valuable aspects of secular culture, but within moderation and done in a careful way. Being Orthodox and also modern means uh, to be. Um,
one person. Why did God create many different national leaders? And the seven nations would come from those leaders. And the Gemara says, Gemara says, a very important idea. It says that if that God created mankind from other Marishon and Saba to say that no individual is superior to any other individual. It means when you're on the basketball court, you can't say, oh, my father can jump higher than your father, my father's stronger than your father. And it means that that you can't do yourself as superior and you can't talk to others of different uh, beliefs, even, even others that were not Jews, you can't talk to them in a descending, a condescending uh, fashion. And that is a Torah tradition. And it's in its introduction to Sefer Bereshit. It says the Sefer Bereshit is called the Sefer HaYeshara. It's the book of the upright. And it's the book that talks about the lies of Abba Yisak and Yaakov and Sarah, the Rachel, and Leah, and Yosef. And then it says, says why are these Abba called Yesharim upright? Because we see the way they reached out to and were inclusive of all others, even those not of their faith. We see Abba was willing to put his life on the line to pray for the people of Sodom. We see when the messengers, when the Malachi came to his home, right? He asked them to wash their feet. Before they walked in, Arash says the reason why he asked them to wash their feet is because he thought maybe they were idol worshippers and they had to wash off. The idol worship. But yet, so he didn't want to bring those values into his home. They had to wash up their feet before they came inside. But yet, he went to all lengths and didn't spare a single thing in the hospitality, in the warm hospitality of these individuals, and he treated them as angels. And lo and behold, they were angels. So I think what it means in my mind to be centrist is to live the middle, middle ground. It means spiritual and physical. It means particularistic, but also universalistic. Um, it means Abra, and also the real world recognized in the real world. Maybe I'll just mention as one example, maybe a little bit controversial, and all my remarks that I'm prepared, that's the good thing, these are all up the top, so nothing can be quoted and it can't get into any trouble because it's just... But just using as an example, and I'll use all, you know, Dr. Kim Ramiz about recently the ban that was issued in Israel um, by some rabbis saying that you can't sell homes or rent apartments or rent homes to Gentiles. And I don't know, it's not my place, of course, to disagree with rabbis, certainly rabbis in Israel out here living in America, and I'm a, a young group of rabbi. rabbi. But I'm saying this because many, many rabbis in Israel, and the RCA also, came out with a statement and statements against that day. And my view when, you know, that, that day that came out, you know, there was a little uproar, happened, uh, it seems like this is racism, this is discrimi- discrimination against the non-Jews, how can we come out with a blanket prohibition that you can't sell homes to the non-Jews? And certainly the intention of the rabbis who wrote that ban was a good one. They're looking after the identity of the Jews. Who here doesn't care about the identity of the Jews? Who here doesn't care about the values of your community? And certainly if we can even imagine a place ourselves in Scott or in Yushalayim and sense and imagine the pulsating spirituality of these places. So we really don't fully understand the situation. But what it means to, to live in the real world means to be sensitive with how things are going to be perceived. And you have to be, you have to say the words of Torah and pronounce the words of Torah in a way that brings dignity and integrity and brings a kiddush Hashem to the words of the Torah. And the Rebertha, the first the, the, the chief rabbi of Israel, the chief rabbi of he traveled before the state of Israel, then he was the first chief rabbi, the state of Israel was established. He said that the state, that we have to recognize the rights of all the Gentiles, even if it forces us to rely on a minority, a lot of people. So that's maybe one example of, of being a you know, centrist orthodox, or being orthodox, but also living in the real world, is being sensitive to the concerns of things in the world and how the way we live our lives are going to be perceived by those around us. And that valuing um, and giving respect to every single human being and also to that which is out there in the culture 
also, one of the things I've learned this weekend in coming to Los Angeles is that I think the people who live here are far more spiritual than the people in New York. Because, you know, in, in New York, they're having a big snowstorm, and people just accept it. Here, when it was raining, every single person took it as a personal front, and they would come over to me and say, we're so sorry for the weather. <laughs> so really, we really feel so bad that it's raining today. And, and, and when we were studying it, look, did you see what we did? Look at the sun. Is it on So I think, you know, there's no question. I, I definitely see the connection to God and spirituality out here more than in other places. Um, the Torah tells us in Parsons by Midbar that they frame the time. It's now the second year after the Jewish people have left Egypt. It's the second month. It's the month of the year. And God decides once again to take a survey of all the Jewish people. But this time, instead of taking a survey by individual people, God decides to take a survey by each particular tribe. As the Torah describes it, each al each individual shave came forward, and each individual tribe came with their own flag, their own banner, their own color, their own motto, and that's how they were counted. In the Sefer Emes Niyako, Bernardo Kamenevsky asks a very good question. Here we have the Jewish people. They just came out of Egypt. We're trying desperately to form a nation. These are people who were enslaved for hundreds of years. There was not a person who left who could remember freedom. And yet, this concept of individuality is being stressed. Isha Titla, you don't do that. You know, you see the inter, inter community rivalries, inter state rivalries. You've got certain communities where, you know, Oklahoma is playing Texas and you see the differences. You see people when they start talking about their alma mater in their school. It creates divisions among people. It is not a unifying force. Why would God ask each and each shepherd, shepherd to come forward, each of people with their with their with their banner? And so, Rav Yaakov says, we understand there's a concept in the Torah. But the, con- the Torah is not a chronological book. It's a history book. It's not a chronological book. And look at the look at the Torah. And when you go to the very next parsha, the parsha is not so. You see that the events take place on the second year in the first month. So the first parsha in Bamidbar is the second year of the second month. The second parsha in Nusso is the second year, the first month, which is Nisan. And what happened in that month? We erected the Mishkan. The Mishkan was now put in place. Who come on Mishkan? And what Yaakov says, a beautiful, beautiful thought, is once the Jewish people had the Mishkan, they had their Torah, and the Torah became the center of their life, then individual communities, individual people, individual tribes were allowed to now express themselves in their own way. Ruben was Ruben, and Shimon was Shimon, and Yisachar was Yisachar. They were not alike, and they were not supposed to be alike. But what kept them together was the centrality of the Torah. So when someone asks me sometimes, are you uh, a modern Orthodox Jew? Are you a centrist Jew? I said, you know, Every Jew was a centrist Jew, because in the Midbar, every single Jew was a centrist Jew. The center of the Jewish world was the Mishkan, was the Torah. And then each individual Jewish community so fit to do what they thought was correct within the confines of that Mishkan. And so it's only when people say, you are modern, or they say, no, no, I'm a very old traditional Jew. Some of the other people, though, they're the modern Jews. I'm not a modern Jew. I go back to the time of the Midbar, and that's the way God created the Jewish people. And so to me, a centrist Jew means that every aspect of your life revolves around Torah and Torah principles. And that means that you're a centrist Jew in the workplace. You're a centrist Jew in the base of, the base of measures. You're a centrist Jew in your shul. You're a centrist Jew how you deal with everyone else, including issues of women, including issues of special needs, including issues of universality, of everything. And when we do that, we understand that, that the Torah's frame, the Torah's frame of reference allows us this individuality, allows us to be a Torah observant Jew, a centrist Jew, and yet be a modern Jew. Because the Torah wasn't written, it wasn't put together by God 3,500 years ago and given to us because it doesn't apply to us because we're so different. We're so different today than ever before. Every community was always different. Every generation was always different. But God understood that. And God understood that if you're a centrist Jew and you really have Torah 
values and core principles, you're going to be a Jew that is caring and concerned and honest and ethical, a Jew that is going to care about their community, about individual people, individual people's needs. People are not going to be looked down upon, even though some people may say in certain lot extent that certain people are not given the same rights. Maybe there's a certain uh, idea behind that also. But the point is, we're not, we're not as centrist Jews, but what we believe is that the totality of the Jewish people centers around the Mishkan, around the Torah, just as it did at the time of Harsina. Uh, uh, I remember one time going into an elevator. I was in Israel. And I'm in an elevator in the Plaza Hotel, and I see a very nice young couple. And they had just got married. He was graduated from Columbia uh, University. She's from Barnard. He was going on to law school. She was going on to school for social work. He was dressed with a um, black velvet yarmulke identification and a blue shirt. And I threw everybody off a little bit. What does that mean? <laughs> okay, and nice with black pants. She was dressed very familiar with a nice hat that she was wearing with gray. And I said, what are you doing in Israel? And I said, well, we just got married. And we're going to be sitting and learning for one year. I'm going to school. I'm pretty sure he was going to another yeshiva. We're sitting. We decided to take work for one year. And we're going to be studying. And then next year, we're going back. Sure enough, uh, two floors down, another young couple comes up. And he's dressed in a pair of shorts and a little tank top. Keep us from God, pretty small. She's dressed not as Tanua as the first woman. And I said, oh, so where are you from? Oh, well, uh, we just got, just got married. I graduated from YU, <laughs> and I graduated Stern. I said, what are you doing on vacation for a few weeks? We're touring Israel, and then we're going to Europe, and we're going to other places, and we're coming back. And so, the other day I landed in the lobby, and the first couple from Columbia and Burnham, they looked at me and said, can I ask you a question? I thought we were modern Orthodox students. What if they? So I said, they're also modern Orthodox students. And that's the point. The point is, Let's not be judgmental. I think if we, if, we, if we stop being judgmental about every single situation, and stop thinking, one, one thing I think is so important, if we stop thinking that everything has to be our way 1,000%, that if it's not our way 1,000, it's our way 95%, well, you know what? It's not so bad. 85%, maybe it's not so bad. And we can understand that that's the Torah way. The Torah way, a centrist Jew to me, means that Torah values are permeate your life. The Torah values properly understood make us a very caring, concerned, liberal group of people. And I think that's what's made us successful all those years. Issue. On the issue of uh, centrism, I think there is a lot to be said for labels. They're like easy monikers. They're easy shortcuts to uh, distinguish people. But I can tell you as a marketing guy, um, you can run into a lot of trouble. It's a big price to pay. The centrist one is one that's extremely delicate because it's, it has that, in marketing, we call it that sort of never-never land. If you can't decide who you are, then you're sort of in the center. I'm neither here, neither there. So that's a risky run with labels. Um, one of my issues with labels, and that happens with Sephardic, Ashkenazi, Chabad, you name it, is they get so in love with their label that they forget that the label is a vessel to something deeper. And that something deeper is very simply the word Judaism. And what I find missing in so many of our discussions is just the word Judaism. And ironically, I hear it more often when I go into the non-Orthodox world. When I'm in conservative reform synagogues, they use the word Judaism more often. And I'm saying, what a shame. It would be so wonderful if, you know, we, the word Judaism was in more of our magazines and more of our discussions, I, I actually think that the word Judaism is much sexier than the word modern orthodox. There's something so much more authentic and deep, and it goes back to Sinai, but just the idea of the word Judaism, and somehow, in a way, we could live centrism, we can live modern orthodox, but I would love to see us take that word Judaism and bring it back into our uh, vocabulary as a way of strengthening our connection with our community. If I see a, a kid who's thinking of leaving the Dara, it's easier to leave modern orthodox than it is to leave Judaism. There's something so fundamentally powerful about, about the idea of Judaism, and we get so caught up in our differences that we forget that simple truth. So I just wanted to share that with you. Subject number two. I read something again in Jewish Action. I love this magazine. And it's a phrase that really caught my attention. I think we can maybe spend a 
innovation without allowing for change. How do you do that? So I encourage you to read the, the, the article. It's terrific. But I will use that phrase to introduce our next subject. Um, it's worded here, what is the relationship between rabbinic authority and our ability to think, practice, and how we see fit as individuals. I'll put in my two cents on this after the panelists speak, and I will ask each one to spend a few minutes. Julie was very disciplined. She spent her few minutes. So, uh, go ahead, Julie. Uh, question number two. Um, given this question, it was phrased a little differently, and then this morning, Rabbi Mosey said, you know, the, the question was changed a little bit. Here it is. Um, the question, when it was given to me originally, asked about this concept of Das Torah. Um, and I said, I don't even know what Das Torah is. Um, and so I had to go research what is Das Torah. Um, luckily, Rabbi Kinoski had a paper from 1985 in Bernard Rebel School all about Das Torah. And I found out not only what it is, but why I didn't know what it was to begin with. So, Das Torah is um, this concept that rabbinic authority transcends just, uh, just answering a question about Kalacha and answering the Shiloh. It's that rabbis have almost a divine uh, inspiration, almost a Ruach HaKodesh, where they can figure out what the right way to handle any situation is, whether that situation has halakhic ramifications, has a halakhic basis, or doesn't. And that you have to submit to the authority of the rabbis on that question. Now, I had, I had kind of heard of the concept on a personal level, of, you know, when you have to ask a child about everything in your life. You know, my, my, uh, my cousin's son is having their first birthday party. The kid is not Jewish because the mother isn't Jewish. Can I go? That's okay, quasi halakhic question. Who should I vote for? Where should I live? Where should I send my kids? Not so halakhic questions. But it turns out that there's a whole uh, political history to this, and that Dodd's Car is actually one of the dividing lines between modern and not modern orthodoxy. One of the dividing lines over the decades between a good Israel on one hand and the ultra orthodox, and we use all those shorthand monikers that we, none of us believe in, um, and in modern orth and modern orthodoxy is represented by the OU and the RCA. And over and over again, modern orthodoxy, the OU and the RCA, rejected the idea of God's Torah, that you have to submit to rabbinic authority to, de to decide political issues. And the political issues that were coming up were, um, don't correct me if I'm getting all this wrong from the term paper, <laughs> so my, my main source here, um, ideas of not Jewish feminism, but secular feminism. Should we support the Equal Rights Amendment? Should we support uh, rabbis participating, Orthodox rabbis participating on interdenominational boards with non-Orthodox rabbis. Uh, some of the other issues were Zionism, really important issues on Zionism, and where are we going to fall um, when we talk about Zionism. And critical issues about how active um, rabbis and Jews should be in um, in in making waves on the American political scene, even during the Holocaust. How much should we push? How much noise should we make? And these were all questions that were decided, on the, you know, in a Buddhist control, they were decided by the Arabani, and that was given out to everybody. And, my, and the RCA and the OU said, no, we're not going to do that. So it's interesting to me that it was even, it's even being asked at an OU conference what our position is on Das Torah because I thought we have a position on this, unless things have changed a lot since 1985, where my research stopped. Um, so it's, it's, to me, it's, are we asking this because it's part of another one of the symbols of the pull right word in the centrist modern Orthodox community, um, this pull right word where we're constantly looking over our right shoulder to see what our brothers are doing, our sisters are doing. Are we from enough for them? Are we as from as they are? where we've lost confidence in our own ability to make their, our own statements uh, because we're so worried about what they're thinking about us and are we now veering toward this model of Das Torah so that we can be more kosher for that. And I would say that, you know, not to actually answer the question of what is the relationship between critical authority and, and our, our personal um, ability to make these kind of decisions, decisions um, I think it's, it's crucial for us to have the personal responsibility in making these kind of decisions. I think that submitting to 
rabbinic authority for all of these kind of questions is just the easy way out. It's giving up. It's saying, I don't have to take personal responsibility. I don't have to make these tough moral, moral ethical decisions because my rabbi is doing it for me. This doesn't mean you shouldn't get rabbinic input. It doesn't mean that you don't value rabbinic wisdom and the scholarship and the, you know, rabbis are rabbis for a reason because they have a level of erudition that we don't have. Um, and that they can share with us and, and a kind of a broad way of looking at things. You value that, but then you make your own decision. Um, and I think that this is not something that I'm just making up. I think that it's actually in, I think it's very deeply in our tradition. Um, in my Gemara class just last week, we were studying um, the question of if you can, if you can um, send a shalia, if you can send an agent to commit a sin, to do a dara um, and the conclusion is that no, you can't send an agent to do a dvar avira because once you have, once they, they are actually doing something that is a transgression, that personal responsibility is theirs. And they, they can no longer be considered an extension of the agent. That is their own personal responsibility. And the phrase that's used about that is, um, and this is on Kedushin Membet, I would bet, divrei hara, divrei talmid, divrei mi shamid. You have on the one hand the words of the Rav, and in this case, the Rav is symbolizing God. And on the other hand, you have the great Tommy, the words of the student, in this case, the student is the Rabbi, um, who are you going to listen to? Right? So somebody is telling you, go do something wrong, but you know better than that, you're going to listen to God. You're going to make that direct decision yourself because you have your own, your own personal responsibility. And I take every opportunity that I can to quote what I next want to quote, which is from, um, it, this is from Dvarim, from uh, Yitzhavim. It's at the end of, um, the very end of Moshe's life where he's giving his directions to everybody of how to act as moral people and as, as strong Jewish people. Um, and this is, you know, again, this is from Dvarim. This is from the mouth of Moshe. This is not a midrash. This is not a comment. This is something that God told us. And I'm going to read the whole thing. It's a little bit of a long time. I'm going to read the whole thing because I think it's worth it.
I wrote certain things on a piece of paper. I finally came my turn to speak to the Rebbe. Um, I spoke maybe for a few seconds. He had an uncanny, frankly, um, ability to assess the situation. Um, it was eerie and surreal a little bit with the way he was able to understand the situation. But it was two seconds for me to him, and then he told me exactly what to do. I said, what about this? He said, okay, this and then this. Boom. The next day, we come into the office of Ravaron in the yeshiva, in the yeshiva in Gush. The previous day, it was just me. My wife had to stand outside. Today, it was both of us that came inside Ravaron's office. And Ravaron said, okay, come and explain to me the situation. Ten minutes, twenty minutes, a half hour. I'm going on and on about the situation. All the different particulars, this side, that side, and Ravaron is just sitting there. After I'm done with my presentation, Sir Ravaron maybe helps me articulate and sharpen some of the questions of the issue. He says, you know, you, you emphasize this thing, maybe you should think a little bit more about that thing. But at no point did Ravaron say, you have to do this. And he heard the whole situation. And to me, this was a study in contrast. Here, day number one, I went to a Rebbe and he said, you have to do this. And just follow this way. That was certainly the easier approach. Um, it took the responsibility off of me, and I was able to just follow what he what he wanted me to do. But the second day was a totally different approach, where Aaron wasn't giving me the easy way out. He wasn't making the decision for me. Rather, maybe he was helping me think through the issue. Now, if it was a halachic issue, with the Usher, he would have told me. Um, if there was one, it was a black and white issue, he would have shown me how it was black and white. But it was a little bit outside the realm of strict halacha. It wasn't even in the medical or financial world, but it was something that wasn't, you know, found in the four parts of the Shulchan. And so, what Rav Aaron's approach has always been, and Rav Amitav, if one of the to quote him again, writes in one of his books, is that, is that, of course, we view the rabbi, you know, in a revered way. Certainly, I'm not coming to minimize the role the rabbi would be out of the job if I did. Um, but certainly, there's a place for the rabbi to teach and to inspire and to raise up the congregation and to seek out his advice. But at the same time, what Ramit Hal writes is that every person is capable and responsible to make your own independent decisions. And that a person's strength of character is built when you approach a situation and work at it and think it through, if necessary, ask advice and come to a decision on your own. We pray every day in this one answer, the Fanenu Meitcha, Dea Binan Ba'askel. Give us, God, a sense of counsel and understanding so that we can make the decision. And the rabbi's role is to empower you. Of course, to teach the halakha, there's black and white situations, there's things that are prohibited and permitted. But the rabbi's job, at least what I was told in Rabbi Tal writes, is to educate the students to be able to be capable on their own to make the decision to make the right decision. So that is my view. Um, I think in, in, in many cases it's just the easy way out for the rabbi to, to give the answer. You know, the rabbi, the easy way out, I was over one Shabbos, a person came over to me, a parent came over to me just a couple of weeks ago and said, Rabbi, please, when you get to Minnesota, make sure that you don't give out psicha to anyone else because my rabbi said that I need to get every single psicha, you know, because my wife is expecting. And it's certainly a custom to get the psicha, to open up the own as a, you know, the foreshadow, as an auspicious sign that it should be an easy labor in the living. But those are just symbols. The hard work is much deeper and much broader than that. You know, it's the easy way out to just check the mezuzahs and change the mezuzahs like the like the, the couple that come to the rabbi, the couple are totally not observant. They don't observe any of the mitzvot. And the child went off to Israel and started getting inspired by Torah mitzvot. So they were very upset by this. That the, the child, you know, was, was going against their way of life. They were totally not observant. And they didn't have any kashrut in the home. And the child had discovered kashrut and the mitzvot. So they came to the rabbi and said, Rabbi, what should we do? The rabbi said, I think you should check your mezuzahs. <laughs> So there's a place for the rabbi, but also there's a place, and it's a tremendously empowering statement, that there's a place also for the decision of every single person to decide in his own. Come in, Tiyam Hashem Elokecha. 
right, to be upright and just and faithful in God and to try your best to come to the right decision. It's not about mezuzahs and it's not about, well, it is about mezuzahs, but it's much broader and deeper of what the mezuzah represents. And after they got married, uh, things were not great with the mother-in-law. Happens once in a while. And uh, they came, they were speaking to the rabbi, the, the, the rabbi, they were telling him what's going on. So he decided he has to do something about it. So he called in the mother-in-law and he said, look, your son just got married. He has a new life, his new wife. They have to make their own life. Stop interesting. Stop giving them ages. Okay? Stop giving them ages all the time. So the mother turned to the rough and she says, I don't give ages. I give advice. <laughs> oh, that's different. Advice are different than ages. So, you know, Julian, sometimes when we talk about that story, let's not get hung up on that we change things because now we're putting a new word into the lexicon. I think David said it best. There are a lot of words that come about that become phrases today. So that story has always been around. Going to speak to rabbis has always been around. It's a question of, you're right. I think that in our world, to a certain extent, we try to balance the difference between do we go to the rabbi for every single question or do we go to the rabbi because the rabbi is the learned person in the community, the person that we can turn to, who can give us good advice, give us good suggestions. And it's things that we deal with every day at the OU. I mean, many, many issues that happen, and sometimes we take political issues, you know, uh, and we don't always seek all the advice that we maybe should, or maybe we could, but we feel, certainly, we have enough understanding, but yet there are other issues that come about that we feel absolutely compelled to go to our rabbis, and not necessarily because they impose on us, as Rabbi Tom said, this is what you should do, but they give us enough food for thought, and give us enough direction and guidance that they lead us down a path that they that I think they want us to follow. Yes, sometimes they tell you very clearly, yes, right or wrong, this is what you have to do. But in many times they give us that advice. And we're certainly not, a, well, we're, we're not talking about a world ever, I don't believe, at the OU, in our world, where I just saw a situation in my own personal family, people that I know, a person who's in Israel, he happens to be a Rebbe in Yeshiva, he has about seven or eight children, his wife had just given birth, one of his students was getting married in the States, sent him a ticket, would like him to come to be at the wedding. His wife had just given birth maybe two, three, four days beforehand. And he went to the Rebbe to ask, should I go to the States or should I stay here with my wife to help? And, you know, to me, I didn't quite understand that. I mean, you have a husband, you have a wife. Together, you work it out. Whatever it works for both of you, that's, that's what works. The Rebbe is not the one that has to decide what he should be taking this trip to the States or not. And I don't think we're, that's the kind of world we're looking for, nor the kind of thing that I think we're ever going to be doing at the OU. But certainly we deal with this issue on a regular basis. And I think that that's covered to me means that we have Baruch Hashem, thank God, some incredibly knowledgeable, brilliant people who have spent their lives in a world of Torah and a world which is pure. And we turn to those people and we look to them for guidance on a regular basis at the OU. Certainly when it comes to conscious issues, we have no problem. We definitely go to our dust camera, and they give us guidance. When it comes to other issues, we certainly deal with them also. And some of the things that were going on just now in Israel with the whole Rotom bill and the conversions and what's happening with that, we did speak very clearly to dust camera. And in other issues that some people didn't know about, where we dealt with other parts, where we believe very strongly the idea that we have a very big tent, a very big tent. We want everyone to be part of that tent. We dealt with God's Torah when it came to that, and I think because of that, we came to some very good conclusions, some wonderful conclusions that allowed everyone to operate within the framework of halacha and the framework of Judaism. So, yes, I do think it is, it is true that in certain parts of the world, the rabbi is the one, God's Torah tells you what to do day and night, period. I think in our world, we want to find the perfect blend between giving us the ability to think on our own to a certain extent, but certainly dealing with the wisdom the ages that I think is most important. Thank you, Julie, Steve, Rabbi. Um, I read something from uh, Rabbi Norman Lamb recently. It was, uh, I think, a sermon he gave like almost 40 years ago in Manhattan. 
on the controversy on the uh, Saturday night when you have to light a Hanukkah candle, and which candle do you light first, the Abdallah or the Hanukkah? It's like this grand, wonderful Talmudic debate that goes on forever. And he, he, he comes up with an interesting observation that it turns out the way it sort of happened, by uh, not by planning necessarily, is that in the synagogue they light the Abdallah candle first, I'm sorry, in the synagogue they light the Hanukkah candle first, and at home you light the Hanukkah, the uh, uh, Abdallah candle first. The idea being that the synagogue represents Pitsum Judaism, the outdoor, sexy, grand Judaism that you see in the magazines and in the sermons, and in the home represents the Judaism when nobody's looking. It's the inside Judaism. And when I hear this debate between rabbinic authority and, and the individual uh, and, and how do we resolve these, these issues? What strikes me first is how little controversy there is when it comes to a lot in our personal lives. That in many ways, 99.9% .9 of the alaqa is pretty much set if you want to live the orthodox lifestyle. And when, and in terms of my personal life, I rarely have a situation where I need to go to a rabbi for a, an alaqa view because most of the time I know what I need to do. And it's true that uh, the, the sexy part is to look at the, the debates, you know, the introduction of the woman and the services. There's so many controversial issues, whether it's the uh, statement from the rabbis, whether we're allowed to rent the non-Jews and so forth. That's the sexy outdoor Judaism. But for so many of us, these don't really touch our lives personally. You know, so I think in, in, in another approach for me that we need from the rabbis instead of so much the halachic uh, inspiration is more the inspiration of um, why should I do these things? And how can I, how can I look at putting on fulfillment in a new way? How can I look at the halachic lifestyle rather than trying to ask myself, am I allowed to do this or what's the ruling on this? I think what works today is really some kind of a, almost a poetic reinforcement uh, of the halachic way. I've, I've read a poetic view of the hundred brachas that give me the goosebumps. I've read so many things that just completely elevate me. So when I put on tefillin, it just, it's a whole new experience. And I think there's so much importance on, on the what and the how and the where and the when that for most of us, the big question is why and how we can enhance it. So that's my two cents on point number two. Now we head for the final point, which here is where we are. Uh, we end on a bang, which is a real positive point, and we all can come out of here feeling really optimistic about the future of the Jewish people. We often focus on the problems we face and difficulties of Jewish life. What are the things of which our generation should be the most proud of? What are our greatest successes, and how can we build on them? Julie. by Broy's talk right before this, might, I might be contradicting what he just told us about the very high exit rate from, uh, from orthodoxy. But I do think that one of the things that works in orthodoxy is Jewish continuity. You know, when I go to broader Jewish conferences that are not orthodox, that's the big question, is Jewish continuity. Are our kids going to be Jewish? Are our grandkids going to be Jewish? Are we transmitting the heritage to them? And I think we've answered that. I think, yes, there are, there are kids who leave, and yes, there are people who don't stay in it. But even when they leave, they, are still, they still keep their Judaism. Their, their Judaism, if not their orthodoxy. Um, but I think for the most part, we've done a pretty good job at giving, um, giving our kids something they can hold on to, giving them a Judaism that they can feel good about, a Judaism that's joyous, a Judaism that they can feel pride in, a Judaism that is intellectually stim stimulating, and, and most importantly, a connection to generations back. That, you know, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, my grandmother did these things, and that's why I'm doing them. So I think that we're, I think that we're pretty good at that. It's okay, Dad, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, I think also we've done, um, and this also has to do with, with kids, um, we've done a pretty good job at keeping our kids um, grounded in this world, but also pretty sheltered from it. I, um, 
recently watched the show Weeds. I don't know if anybody has ever seen it, but it's disgusting. It's horrible. And it's, it's Weeds. Has anyone seen Weeds? It just shows it's this woman who, this rural housewife who takes to selling marijuana when her husband dies so that she can make a living. And it's, I just look at it, and I know it's not reality, but if it's even like 20% of reality, the world out there is really scary and disgusting, and I'm happy to be in a world that is much more sheltered and wholesome and all sorts of things that it's not out there. So I think we've done a good job of that, um, although, again, it's a, very, it's a, diffi- it's a difficult balance uh, to achieve of keeping them sheltered, but at the same time keeping them open enough so that they have some experience with the world out there so it's not shocking when they go out there. Um, I think we do a very nice job with class setting, with Sedaka, and with teaching um, with ourselves acting in ways that treat other people with dignity, that give other people the charity they need, that give other people the help they need. I mean, when somebody in our community is sick or has a baby or when somebody dies, they are taken care of. And I think that that's a very beautiful thing within our community. I think a challenge is to take that impulse and turn it outward a little bit so that it's not just to other Jews, but it, that it's to everybody else in the world. And I think I think we're absorbing that. I think that that's happening also. You can see, I know why you now has some programs where instead of just sending kids to uh, Russia to reach out to, to the Jewish communities there that don't have much Judaism, in addition to that, they're sending kids to third world countries, to developing countries, to uh, you know, build the pipelines and, the, and dig the wells and do the hard work for communities that are not Jewish, and that there is a value in reaching out to communities that are not Jewish. Um, I think we have made some important strides in terms of where women are in Judaism. Um, if you look at a hundred years ago, women were mostly illiterate when it came to Ju- when it came to Jew- Judaism. Um, Sara Schneer, with founding the Beis Yaakov movement in 1917, changed a lot of that, and our community has really run with that. And now women are very educated. Women um, are, are doing better in Jewish circles. They're, I mean, if you look at the, the women who are here, you know, we're part of the Jewish uh, we're part of the Jewish conversation. We're part of the fabric of the community. I think that's very important. Now, anybody who knows who knows are not going to leave that right there. Um, the, I think that there, we have a long way to go with how we incorporate women. Um, and I think that the, the, um, the main thing when it comes to women in Judaism is that women need to have some ownership of their Judaism. You can't really love something. You can't really pursue something. You can't really understand something if you don't have ownership of it, if you don't feel like it's really yours. That's a challenge in an Orthodox synagogue where we sit over there and all the action is happening over here. And it's a challenge that is hard to meet because, you know, somebody asked me in the room, some, um, Rabbi Broid mentioned a um, egalitarian Orthodox synagogue, and somebody said, I've never heard of such a thing. What is that? And it's a good question. What is that? And, you know, there are some small pockets where that's happening, and I'm not suggesting that that's what needs to happen everywhere, but I think that we need to pay attention to how... Um, how women feel about their Jewish experiences. I think there are things that we can do to make Mephitsas more friendly so that there's a clear line of vision, at least. If you're not participating, at least you can see what's going on and you don't have things in front of your face. Um, I think that, you know, something as simple as bringing the Torah around to the women's side, which I think most love and post scheme will agree doesn't. There are no issues with that, and yet it's not done. And yet that physical proximity, we do it in my shul, and the physical proximity of being able to touch the Torah, to physically touch the Torah, to be able to carry it and to have women coming at you from all sides to kiss that Torah is powerful. And I think more of our shuls need to be doing that. Um, the first time I ever saw the letters of the Sefer Torah, I was 19 years old. This is after 15 years of formal Jewish education. I was 19 when I ever saw the actual letters of the Sacred Torah, because I never saw it more than Hagba across the Mephita with something in my face. And yet, when I can actually see the letters up close, it's, it's powerful. It's powerful, and I think that men don't realize that these experiences are missing from women's lives. Um, in my show, we have a women's QA group where we actually lean, where we lead davening. Again, that's not for everyone. I understand it's not for, for everyone, but I think it's important to have that option there for women. Um, when, I, uh, when I, again, after I was married, my husband taught me to lean. So you can learn to lean to actually lean, or you can learn to lean just to learn the trope. The trope is the punctuation 
of the Torah. And if you're reading Chumash without knowing the trope, you're not reading Chumash. You're missing half of it. Um, and if, if you don't know the ways, you have to do things. Like when I was at Yula, and we had to memorize um, Chazon Yishayahu, we had to memorize um, the, the prophecy of Bilam. So what do we do? What do you do when you want to memorize a really long paragraph? You put it to music. What music do we put it to? Yankee Doodle, It's a Small World. That's ridiculous. It has its own tune. It has trope. If we had learned trope, we would have been able to memorize it with a little bit more dignity and respect for the actual words themselves. So I think that there are many uh, strides that we can make in terms of women. And I'll just say one other thing, which is um, I think probably the most important thing, which is education for women. We have made great strides. Women are much more educated than they used to be. But I really think that it's time that we take away this false barrier of what women can and can't learn. Again, I have 15 years of formal Jewish education. I never learned Gemara. I've been learning Gemara since my formal Jewish education ended, you know, for 20 years. And yet, I still feel functionally illiterate when it comes to 75% of our Jewish texts because it's an Aramaic, and I never learned it. And if you don't learn it as a kid, it's very hard to catch up, as everybody knows. And so here we are telling our women, go to Harvard, become a doctor, become a lawyer, take ownership of, of, of every intellectual pursuit you can, but only with, you can't um, have all of these texts open to you. And I think we're going to lose our women with that. I think our girls are just going to say, what do you want from me? This doesn't make sense to me. And how can I take ownership of it if I don't understand, if I don't really get it? So I think that's something where we have to push ourselves forward. I have about six other things on my list here, but I'm going to just um, pick one other to throw out there because I don't want to take too much time. Um, and this is something that we are just now starting to do right, since the question is what can we be proud of, and I do want to answer it that way. Um, maybe I, I don't remember exactly, it was about a, a few months ago, about 150 rabbis signed a document um, that laid out an orthodox position on gays on homosexuality, on how we need to treat um, gay people with more dignity, how we need to welcome them into our congregations. I don't want to quote the document because I don't remember it offhand, but it was a start. But I think that this is going to be one of the biggest challenges to Jewish continuity, to Orthodox continuity that we are going to see. Because if you look around at the people who are sitting next to you, I can promise you that one of your grandchildren or your niece or your nephew or your neighbor's grandchildren or your neighbor's niece or nephew is going to come out of the closet as gay. And they're going to say, I have, you can shake your head and say, God, I hope it doesn't happen to me, but it will, I promise you. And one of you is going to have to say, oh my God, my child is gay and they're in love with this man. And they have a child together. Do I let them into my community? Do, they throw, do I throw them out of my community? Do I give them another way to be Jewish? We're going to have to think about this. We can shake our heads as much as we want, but we're going to have to think about this because it's our children. And it's important. And it's their dignity and it's their lives. It's their love. It's their lives. It's who, it's who they are. Um, so that's, I think, a challenge that will be a huge challenge for all of us to undertake in the coming years. The word that represents affliction in the Torah is nega. And if you take the ayin from the end of that word, nun gimel ayin, and you put it at the beginning of the word, it spells the word oneg, the light. It all depends on the perception of the eye, of the ayin. If the ayin is at the back always seeing the negative, then everything in this world is an affliction. We're not doing anything right, there's always a problem. But if you try to see the positive, if the ayin is on the front, is on the positive, so then we could appreciate life as more of an oneg. And sometimes you have the same situation, the same experience, and one person sees the negative as a nega, and the other person sees it as an oneg, as a delight. Speaking about the things that we should be proud of, but also a little bit to be challenged to continue being proud of these things, but I'm amazed on the commitment that people have to their community shul, to the Beit HaKnesset. We have people whose lives revolve around the Beit HaKnesset. They come for tefillah, they come for the Monday Torah class, and then they come for bridge games. And I think the power of the shul as a community center is one of the great successes of American Orthodoxy. And I think just to, you know, that the Orthodox Union and the vibrance and the creativity and energy that Orthodox Union and the leadership that they have um, gets at least part of the credit for, for that, the power of the shul as a vibrant community center of the place, the conduit for, for wonderful things, 
and challenging people for further growth. Relating to this as the shul is a community center, um, I have found this about, you know, from people who are new to the faith or maybe new to the, to the observance of the faith. They're always amazed by the sense of, of community and also the beauty of, of the Shabbat. You know, people who are raised in a Jewish community and raised observance of Shabbat, they don't always appreciate, they take it for granted. And it reminds me of, <coughs> it's, a, it's a, a story that I heard from Shlomo Kalbach. Um, I never heard to tell a story of Shlomo Kalbach, of Moshe, the water carrier, who would go to the Chos of Lublin every Arab Rosh Hashanah to get a blessing. One time he came to the Chos of Lublin, and this time the Chos says to him, Sorry, Moshe, I can't give you a blessing now, you just have to go immediately home. He's surprised, he traveled all this way, he received the blessing each year, but this time the Rebbe doesn't want to accept him, doesn't want to receive him. He starts walking home, and on his way home he stops in at an inn, at a, uh, at a, at a, at a place, at a restaurant of some sort. And he goes in, and he has a drink, and he meets up with some of his friends. And the friends say, Moshe, what's wrong? What's bothering you? And he explains what's bothering him. And they make a l'chaim. And they have a drink with him, a drink of soda, of course, right? This is value. Um, and they have a drink together with him. And they cheer him up. He's about to start walking home, and they say, Moshe, give it another shot. Maybe go back to the Chose of Lublin, the great Chose of Lublin. Told over is a true story. He goes back to the Chose, figures he's give it a, he'll give it a shot. He goes back, he knocks on the door. This time the Chose of Lublin sees him and says, Moshe, thank you so much for coming back. I'm so glad you returned. Now I'm ready to give you a blessing. Moshe says, Thank you so much, but I don't understand. Can you please explain it to me? An hour ago, you kicked me out of your house. Now you're, now you're ready to receive me and accept me. So the Chose says to him, I'll tell you why. Because a couple hours ago when you came, I saw you only had a few hours to live. And nothing that I could say or bless you would change that. And I'm also, I wasn't allowed to tell you what I knew, because I'm not allowed to share the things that I know about the future, but I knew you only had a few hours to live, and therefore I told you immediately go home to be with your family and spend a few hours with your family. But now I see on your way home, apparently you met up with some of your friends. And your friends who care about you and are concerned about you, they wish you l'chaim, they wish you a long life. And with friends that you have and a community that you have, that has given you an extension on life, and now I, I hope and bless you to live out the year and even beyond. That's the power of community, the power of Shabbat, where our communities revolve around the Shabbat table, which is something that I think is incredible. We should never take it for granted, and we should be extremely, extremely proud of. Finally, the third thing, number one is the shul, community, Shabbat. Third thing, and again, we could go on and on and on a little bit, but I don't have that much time, and I'll allow uh, Steve to, to go after me. And that is, and maybe this is something we should be proud of, but also as a challenge, that the challenge is living a life that brings dignity to the name of God. And we live in a generation now where things are written, books are written that either deny God, deny the existence of God, or say that religion is not leading to good, but in fact that religion leads people to do evil. If things are said today that it would have been considered blasphemous to say a generation ago. And so I think we, each of you are intelligent, sophisticated, Jews, friendly, personable, you're out there in the world, and I think you bring a good name to God and a good name to Torah. And thankfully, we're able to raise a generation, a new generation of Jews who also should see the beauty and richness. We have to emphasize the beauty and richness of the Torah, but also who are proud. One of the things that we can be proud of is that we have, that we have the ability to be proud of being Jewish, and it's that sense of being proud that actually brings a good name to God. But I would say that something we should be proud of is that we are doing a good job of bringing a good name to God in Torah. We're making a Kiddush Hashem in the way we live our lives. But of course, that's a challenge. And we have to try even harder on that. And that's the Pasuk we say every day, which means what? You should love Hashem your God. But the Gemara has a different twist on it, which is very powerful. The Talmud says that what it means is also, shem shamayim al yadecha. That is not only that you should love God, but the name of God should be beloved through you and through your actions. And that's what, what that means is that the person at the office should say, every person should treat me like that Jew with the yarmulke treats me. And the housekeeper should say, I want to work every day of the week for that, for that the Jewish family. 
and the neighbor on your block should come over to you and say, I want to make a bar about mitzvah in your synagogue because I see the way you raise your children, and that's the synagogue you go to. I want to make my daughter's bat mitzvah in your synagogue. So that's something we should be proud of, we should continue doing in our lives, but as a challenge, not just loving God, but also, that through our actions, by our example, as best as we can, uh, to that the name of God should be beloved through all of us. Thank you. A wonderful question to end the incredible convention with. The fact that we're here, the numbers that we're here, tells the story of what we should be proud of. Because if 60 years ago you went back to the demographers and sociologists, they were to tell you that there wouldn't be a vibrant Orthodox Jewish community. We'd be in one or two small communities, uh, sheltered, living a very sheltered life. They never envisioned that we'd be powerful. Today in America, under the age of 30, there are more Orthodox Jews than there are conservative and reformed together. It's an incredible number. No one ever expected that. So we have so much to be proud of, so much to look forward to. But I think that, you know, so many times I go to conventions, I go to meetings, and I'm the representative of the Orthodox world. And I've been to so many meetings. I think, Julie, you, you talked about that a little bit. And I go to a meeting, and all they talk about is Jewish continuity, and they talk about Jewish survival, Jewish identity, and they sit there and they talk about the fact that we've got to produce a generation of young people who care about Israel, people who care about their community, care about being Jewish, care about marrying Jewish, and they go on and on and on and on. But, of course, they say we don't want to be Orthodox. But we want all those things. And I think today, with the power of Torah, that's the thing that I think is so important, the power of Torah. Today, because of the ability to learn Torah on the Internet, to learn Torah any way you want, anywhere you want, any place you want, that's going to be the thing that I think we're going to be most proud of. Because we introduced the oldest concept of the world, that what keeps Jewish people together is Torah and Torah values and Torah learning. A, a second Jew in Israel told me one time, he said to me, Steve, if every Jew in the world knew Parshat Hashavua with Rashi, I, I will tell you right now, we'll have very low assimilation. We'll have people who are being proud about being Jewish. No matter how they work, no matter what they look like, no matter where they come from, it won't make a difference. They'll want to be part of Jewish because the strength of the Jewish people the greatest bracha, the greatest gift that God gave was the power of Torah. And today we've unleashed that power. And so today you have people all over the world learning and going on the Internet. We can get four or 500,000 people on a monthly basis on our website. We can have 1,800 people learning our daf yomi. It's an incredible thing. I think that's what we're going to be most proud of because I think we, the Orthodox community, made certain that Torah was going to be available. And now everyone wants to learn Torah. And so I think we have a lot to look forward to. Community, I think we've built wonderful communities. One of my very good friends who's one of the former heads of uh, this conservative community, just retired, and he told me, he called me on the phone, he said, Steve, you're going to be really proud because my wife and I moved to an Orthodox Jewish community in Boca Raton, and we're now a member of the Boca Raton Synagogue. I said, really? Why? He said, because I have no communities. We didn't build communities. And so now, now that I've retired, I want to be, I want to be near a shul. I want to be a place I can go to on Shabbat. I want to be a place where there's learning. Where else could I go? And that's not something we have to be really proud of. I just want to end with one thing. Rabbi Sinchech is here, and she was offered to actually hear, hear it firsthand. I heard it secondhand. But at the Orthodox Union just a few weeks ago, we had a Hanukkah um, luncheon. You know, we don't like to pay people out of money, so we give them lunch. It's, you know, it's a good thing. <laughs> so we, have, we had a Hanukkah luncheon, and we decided to give out a special plaque to all those people who had worked at the Orthodox Union more than 25 years. And there's one man named Anthony Lugo. Anthony Lugo works in the mailroom, has been with the organization for I don't know how many years, obviously more than 25. And he got up to speak. And he said, when I first came here, I thought you people were crazy. I didn't understand what you were doing. I had no idea. And when I would talk to some of the rabbis and I talked to some of the people who worked there, you tell me, what do you do on Saturday? You sit around a table with your kids and you, you sing songs? 
You actually sing songs? You talk with them? He says, we haven't had a discussion like that in our family in years. We never sit around. We never talk. We never do anything. And then I've watched over 25 years. I've watched the people who have been here. I've watched them come in with their children. And now I've watched them come in with their grandchildren. And I've watched the incredible, beautiful life that you have. It's, it's unbelievable. I have so much respect for you and your culture, your way of life, your family, everything that you do. And he made the people there so proud, more proud than anyone else could make, more proud than any rabbi could give in a speech. Anthony Lugo took the people at the OU and elevated us to another level because he made us understand as an outsider what a beautiful life we have. So I think we have a lot to be proud of. I think we have a lot to look forward to. And in the Hashem, with the help of God, we will continue to do what we do take Torah, transmit Torah values, and really enrich not just the world, but the entire, not just the Jewish world, but the entire world. And that, that's part of our job as being Jews, to be that connection to the world. Thank you. Put in my two cents on each. Does anybody want to hear my two cents? No. Besides me. Okay, good. Okay, good. Uh, well, I'll start with the most ridiculous meeting I've ever been to in my life. It was my first marketing meeting. I was a young brand manager at Procter & Gamble, and I was uh, in charge of Ivory Liquid. Yeah. So the ad agency came in from New York. It was a big meeting with the head guy, and I was pretty intimidated. Anyways, the client had asked the ad agency to do something more interesting, more human, more relevant, more emotional, instead of just selling the dishwashing liquid. And Ivory happened to be really soft, so it would make your hands really soft. So. The idea and the reason why it was the most absurd meeting I've ever been into in my life, bar none, is that they call this campaign male appreciation, which is that it's going to make your hands so soft that it's going to improve the connection in your marriage. Oh. Think about that. <laughs> when I say absurd, I'm not joking. I knew I was going to be in trouble then. And it made me think. We have cars that tell you they're going to make you happier. We have banks that tell you they're going to make you a, a better person. We have all these products out there and advertisers that tell you they're going to make you a better person and they're going to make you happier. Meanwhile, we have Judaism. And what do we say? We rarely ever enter that world. So we let the cars and the commercial predators steal the real benefits of life away from us. And if I had to put one line in front of the uh, Orthodox community that we should look at, it's a prosaic, simple line. What's in it for me? How does Judaism make me a better person? How does Judaism make me happier? And the truth is, the more mitzvahs I do, the happier I am and the better person I am and the more ethical I am. That is a really one of the most powerful notions I think in Judaism is to sort of go back to the basics and touch what we call in marketing the bullseye. I love connecting with God. I love connecting with the Jewish people. I love all these big, big ideas. But ultimately, I want to be happier and I want to become a better person, whether it's a better father, a better husband, a better friend, a better Jew, or a better citizen, or a better member of my community. And Orthodox Judaism, with all the mitzvahs and the richness that we have, really is perfectly positioned to deliver on this, on this promise, uh, which is the theme of today, sort of enhancing. And I will just finish on one point. I've been to three events, of, because I've had a lot of relatives in, so I've been to only three events. Thursday night, Friday night, and today. And I will tell you that each of these three events, the Orthodox Union touched on very sensitive, difficult issues. The first one, I saw children who were abused on a video, who had left the path, and I saw their faces on a video screen, and I said to myself, my God, you've got to have a certain amount of chutzpah to be able to put out this kind of dirty laundry and be able to have the, the courage and the strength to talk about it. Friday night, we had a phenomenal discussion with Rabbi Weil and Rabbi Brody on ethics. And then today, we brought up some of the most uh, powerful issues, I think, that are facing the Orthodox world for the future, including some that Julie brought up and some that the panelists brought up. And I think it's a testament to the fact that the Orthodox movement is not afraid to tackle the big issues. And my contribution to this is to look as instead of just preserving 
but to take all the greatness we have in our community and to try to enhance Jewish life. And I want to commend Rabbi Kalinsky for putting all this together. Thank you.